when I became president of the New England Conservatory in 1967, <clears throat> I made a declaration in public that uh, it just pained me terribly. I, I just found it inexplicable that there was not one complete jazz department in any university or college or conservatory in the United States. The music born in this country around the turn of the previous century was not represented in the music curriculum. And I said, that's, that's shameful. This is the one great, the one uniquely original uh, music form that America has contributed to the world. And it is not represented in education. And I said, we're going to have a jazz department. So that's really the beginning. Uh, and what, I, and what, I, what did the board, what kind of oh, <coughs> Well, you there were some people, mostly on the elderly side, who uh, who thought that was an outrageous thought? Who you know that you, you that they you know they along with a lot of people look there was a lot of racial undertones in the thing against jazz and besides that even if it wasn't racial it was a degenerate music it was almost like Hitler you know declaring bad music and uh, and but others of course uh, thought wow that's and and I I used I I remember some people will will say geez guns are going to get a go, get away with this, but uh, what happened was I had been brought to the conservatory to save it because it was financially broke and educationally broke. So if you want me here, then you better let me do what I'm going to do, and then that's what it, that's what I announced. So yeah, I paid no attention to those to those uh, you know objections. And and it didn't it didn't rise into any kind of a movement. We got a like now in the uh, in the uh, presidential campaign, everybody <laughs> fighting each other. I just went ahead, but I didn't have any money to do it. Those were brave words. So we had to wait two years till our financial situation became stabilized, which I I then and two wonderful people in the board two uh, young, at that time, young lawyers, the three of us be began to start raising money, and one of the, our main targets for that was with the Ford Foundation. And to make that story much, much shorter, after two years, we got the word that we will get a two and a half million dollar grant. And then, of course, I could contemplate not only raising the salaries in the school, which were pitiful, but also to start creating the jazz department. So that was the very, very beginnings of it. And, that and then, with faculty, you made your yeah. Faculty. And then I, uh, having worked in New York prior to that, uh, you know, in the 40s and 50s, 60s, uh, having worked with almost every great jazz musician that was around, you know, the modern jazz quartet, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, all those people, who were then my friends and eventually was able to establish something uh, quite, quite solid with, with the, for, for several years, for example, a great, great musician who played five different instruments and who was a composer and everything, Jackie Byard. And I brought in, you know, all kinds of people, I can't remember them all, and it might have been just for a weekend because they were busy working, you know, on the road, or I'd bring them in for a week or something, and also, I, I, uh, what was interesting was that Berkeley, which had uh, s some jazz in it, I wouldn't call it a department, because it wasn't a full curriculum. See, what I meant by a jazz department, I said it has to be an undergraduate and graduate six-year program, just as solid and rich as the classical. And also, it will be relatable to the to the classic department, so they will eventually work together. So, what was interesting and really upset Berkeley very much was that about seven or eight students from Berkeley came over here immediately because here they could get a degree, and they stayed, and and that enriched that gave me a little tiny nucleus of a student body right away, 
at different age levels. And then um, we went into the black community to actually recruit players that we somehow had heard about. Um, and one of them was this amazing uh, saxophone player who now lives in Paris. I'm terrible with names, my God. Ricky, Ricky Ford. Ricky Ford. Yeah, we heard about this Ricky Ford who was 16 or 17 and he was this amazing player. And, uh, and we went to, to his home and met with his parents and invited him to come into the school free scholarship. I did things like that. I went to other homes where this is not a nice bit of news uh, history, where the parents, when they heard the word jazz, just got, no, no, go away, you, you know, you're the devil. You know, there were people who were, who thought the blues were s sinful music, you know, and they're, so, we ran up again. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't believe the thing, but fortunately that, that was sort of in a minority. So we recruited, actually went out there to get a student body. And then, of course, as the years passed, we increased the department. And, uh, and, and eventually um, it became, well, uh, what I'm therefore very proud of, that it turned out to be the first full scale, full-time jazz department in the United States. Now, some people will say, yeah, but there was jazz in Texas or Indiana Union. Yeah, well, they, they had, they maybe had an orchestra, a jazz orchestra, or they had one program or one, one it, but it wasn't a full curriculum and certainly not with degrees. I was very, I, I was very much involved uh, with a friend of mine, um, Dave Baker, who still is teaching at, at Indiana University. He had created a band at Indiana University, but the head of the school would not allow him into the building. And they had to rehearse uh, in some other place. And he was a student there at that time. But, uh, you know, that's how prejudiced it, it all was. And, and I, I just, as I say, couldn't understand it, would not stand for it, and created this department. I, I, I say this in all humility. I, I don't want to be sound bragging, but it was about time because jazz, the beginnings of jazz uh, start in the teens of the century, and by 1967, there was no jazz in a legitimate way in a school, you know. And then, of course, it evolved over the 30, 40, 50 years, whatever it is now, it expanded and then developed into what is now c called the improvisation. So talk about that transformation. Well, you know, I think for a time after I left, you see, I was only here 10 years. I think after a while, the jazz department was, what shall I say, it didn't progress very much. It was a little bit dormant. I'm not, I can't get into a lot of details but I just feel that some of my successors, uh, presidents, were not as <laughs> involved with or as interested in jazz as I was. I mean, I was determined, you know, and I had already spent some of my young life as, as a jazz musician in, 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 at the very highest level. And, and I think uh, they concentrated more on other departments and sort of let this linger. I, 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 if I gave some research and thought to that, I probably could document that. But that lasted for about 15, 20 years. In the meantime, um, there was, of course, this one genius that is still in this school, Rand Blake. I discovered Rand Blake sweeping the floors in Atlantic Records. It, this must have been in, gosh, when, when was it? Must have been in the, in the, 60s, early 60s. Uh, he, I think he even did that for nothing. I don't think he was paid. He just said he wanted to be around jazz musicians. And Atlantic Records was one of the great record companies of that time. And so uh, he, and, and so I asked, who's this guy sweeping the floor? And, uh, and I asked Nesui Ertegun, the head of the company. He said, well, he's a pianist. 
Uh, and uh, well, why is he sweeping the floor? Well, he wants to be around us. He wants to see how things go in a record company. And, uh, and I said, well, uh, what kind of pianist is he? Well, uh, we don't quite get what he's playing. <laughs> Uh, it seems to have some relation to jazz, but, but maybe not. And then suddenly it's gospel music, and suddenly it's some other thing that we don't recognize. So I got my ears perked up, and, and I went to him. And, uh, well, to make a long story short, I discovered that he was an incredible genius pianist who, to this day, still does things that I don't think anybody else can do, and he does not know how he's doing it. So, which means immediately, by the way, he does not read music. Uh, he's learned a little bit, but I don't mean that as a negative. I just mean that he has to improvise because he, he can't read or, or write. So, and what he does is so, it's some kind of extraordinary genius that um, there must be a word, it's not autistic, but it, it's something, you know, in that range where we don't know why it happens. Because the thousands of times I've heard him play, I mean, he did, does things, and I say to myself, as a, as a pretty creative person myself, I say, my God, how, where does that come from? And he's maintained that high level of creativity, of surprise in his music, these 50, 60 years. So anyway, what I did with him was to coach him for about two years because the one thing that he didn't have at that time, he had all these remarkable technical things that he could do on the piano, a touch, uh, colors and so on, that's just magical. I can't even explain them. And, and as I say, he can't either, he just does them. Um, and, and I had, but what he didn't have a control of was the form of his pieces. They were too long or too short, or they didn't develop a, an idea, and some incredible idea was there, but undeveloped, or whatever. And I just led him into that direction. And that took about two years, and he certainly has that now, uh, and ever, ever since. And then I said, okay, at the conservatory, I felt so bad that this guy was totally unrecognized. I got him one record date with RCA Victor, with, with a singer, uh, his first recording, but he was just totally laughed at, un misunderstood, uh, not recognized. What the kind of music is that? Because it didn't swing, it wasn't Benny Goodman swing, it wasn't you know hot, hot, hot music, and it was weird and all that. And so I thought, gee, I, I must do something for him, but I couldn't bring him in as a pianist. That's the one thing that I think there would have been such objection from the piano department that they would, that I, I don't know, I, I might have been fired <laughs> or something. So I brought him in, what was it? I brought him in in a post office. We had a little post, uh, 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 somebody took care of the mail, the mail room, I think. I got him into the school. Again, just like sweeping floors. <laughs> and eventually, I, people began to hear him and then this these sort of question, who the hell is this character? And he became very important in the whole, the, the, the um, what, what was it called? Our outreach department into the, into the, uh, into community. Uh, the community service, uh, what was it? Well, it, today it's community. Well, well, it was a bit different. This oh. was a community outreach. Yeah, community yeah. Community and, 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 and Rand was already, you know, involved with that as a human being. And now he, he, he so he was one of my partners in, in doing these things. So he became kind of a very important person suddenly. And eventually, I, I just, as president said, look, we've got to have him. This is not normal piano playing, but whatever it is, it's great music and we will create a department around him. And he had all these, all this teaching and classes that he gave where you did not read music, which put some other people in, t in the classical department <laughs> into a state of shock, you know. Uh, in other words, everything through the year, meaning listening, listening to great jazz, listening to ethnic musics of all kind, because 
he was interested in that too. And everything was about spontaneous creativity and that, of course, turns out to be improvisation. So that worked its way in and I, I think it would not have happened as much as it did if it weren't for Ran and then also a little bit later Hank Kuznetsky. So those were the two people who then, even during my last years, pushed this thing further into the direction of not just jazz, but the uh, third stream idea of bringing all kinds of ethnic vernacular musics together, folk music, pop musics, whatever. And that took some time to, to, to get across. And then after I left, then it all went much further. And that's, of course, I left, what did I leave, 37 years ago? I think I left. So, I mean, so there's, yeah, so there's a lot of other things that happened after I left. And now, of course, it has grown into a very important, uh, full-fledged, I mean, it's beyond improvisation. It's sort of world, world music, I don't know. I, and I, I remember hearing uh, a year ago in an amazing concert. I don't remember the details of, but there was a lot of what we would call uh, ethnic or vernacular musics that were improvised by students of the New England Conservatory who were who probably came here as classical trumpet players or, or, or guitar players or whatever, and who had been trained to play Indonesian music, uh, you know, in a way that was just incredible. So, I mean, it isn't just that it, that it entered into teaching this and broadening the whole vision of what, what, what musics there are out there and we should become involved with to, to the extent that we can. You can't do everything. I mean, you can't give up Beethoven to study in the nation. You know, it's never, it's only 24 hours in every day. But, you, but the idea just began to be promoted. And I think Tanya was, was the major, major producer of that program. I was stunned because it was one of the, I don't use the word perfect all that often, but it was a perfect concert from beginning to end. And all of these young people were involved with their teachers, including Ran, of course, and many others. Uh, you've got quite a good faculty here now, you know, uh, that has developed in that improvisational department. So it was stunning. And uh, I, I can't, I don't know of any other school, there might be one somewhere, that is doing anything like this at that higher level. I mean, I, I liken what happened here to, to the Mississippi River, which up there in wherever it is in Missouri or North Dakota, it starts as a tiny little stream and it broadens and broadens and broadens. Because when I first started with this idea of third stream, uh, and, and at that time it was only jazz and classical and I wanted to bring those musics together and one way of doing it was creating a jazz department. Other things I did, by the way, to publish jazz, which nobody ever published jazz music. You know, really serious publication like Beethoven symphonies. You can go to a store, buy them. I did all kinds of things like that. But it was always jazz and classical because I just thought it was so terrible that at this late date, jazz had not yet been allowed into the, you know, uh, the, the inner circles uh, uh, of music. And, but then what happened was as, um, and, but my dream was that it would eventually include any kind of music on, on the face of this globe then, and I think still now, or maybe even more so, there, are, there must be something like 300,000 different musics, music traditions. You know, in Borneo, I mean, the godforsaken place, I don't know whether I should say that. <laughs> it's probably very beautiful. <laughs> but there are five different music traditions just in that country, and they are ancient. Well, I'm, I'm taking an extreme example here, but can you imagine the music of Eskimos, of Norwegian uh, Hardanger fiddle music, of Latin American music, of all kinds, all these musics be became available during my lifetime on recordings. When I started collecting records, 
uh, it was very difficult, and I wanted to find such things. I, it was very difficult to find recordings from uh, other than classical and jazz. But then uh, because of, uh, um, uh, God, what was it? This man who started this huge collection of music from all over the world was called Folkways. And that eventually, by the way, ended up, that whole collection ended up at the uh, Smithsonian Institute. And gradually, so much recording of African music, of Asian music of all kind, became available on recordings that people first became aware of them and say, my God, this is great music. Where has this all been, you see? And, uh, you know, Beethoven never heard any, I don't know, Chinese music, you know? So, I mean, and this all, what I'm saying is this all now became not just available, but available to such an extent that you couldn't ignore it anymore. And the quality of all of those ancient music, Indian music, Chinese music, Indonesian music, whatever they, some of them are thousands of years old, that's a high quality of music. Okay, it's improvised. In fact, all those other musics are all improvised. European classical music is the only non-improvised music that, 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 that started, and we thought that was the only thing that should be for centuries. This is all now expanded, and that's all entailed in my, in my dream, and, and I'm so, I get goose pimples when I think about the fact that this has now all happened. I mean, the, the amalgamation of Turkish music with jazz and classical, or, you know, uh, music from Nairobi that somebody who ends up in a college in London in music and combines his native music with other, you know, that's all just happening all the time. Not, not to the extent of, of, of uh, pushing other music aside, it's just growing more and more. So, I mean, even as much as we're doing now already in 2012 and 2010 or whatever, there's still so much more. I mean, there's so much to discover out there. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know why, as a teenager already, I became interested in, in collecting um, uh, ethnic music recordings. I have no idea, just my appetite for wanting to know everything or something, I don't know. That, so. You were well brought up, Gunther? Do you think it was your... your uh... Well, no, I mean, my father had no interest in... I mean, my father was a great musician, and all the musicians around, around me uh, thought I was crazy. I mean, they thought I was crazy buying recordings of medieval music. There were very few. The, the whole early music uh, movement only started in the 50s and uh, with Pro Musica and... and uh, but I was already filling my notebooks with music from all kinds of uh, eras, uh, medieval music, Renaissance music, Baroque music, and my colleagues, you know, in the orchestra, the Met and the Philharmonia, what the hell are you doing that for? You're a horn player, you know, just, say, I look, I've already studied all the Brahms and Beethoven symphony, I want to see what's going on over there in, uh, you know, in, in the 14th century. But I, I, have, I have no, uh, explain, ex how that all was in me, but I just needed to know that because once I found out, when I went, for example, to the 42nd Street Library or the 58th Street Library in New York, they had these enormous collections of, of medieval music or Renaissance music, Monumenti di Ita Musica Italiano, and, and, and I, I just sat in that library and copied out a lot of this music and discovered all these, uh, and also, uh, some of the folks at Harvard in the uh, musicology and uh, history department began to publish older uh, uh, European music. But then that led to over to, uh, let's say, might call Arabian music. I remember having to go to Brooklyn. I forget on what street that was. There were, there were five stores that had music from Tunisia, from Morocco, from Egypt and, and other North African uh, countries and, and Middle East. So this was a perfect storm of, of, of <coughs> leadership with insatiable curiosity. Yeah, yeah. And then stimulated by the, these geniuses like Iran. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
that, that yeah. became very fertile for you. Yeah. Ran is, was into all kinds of music, uh, in, including gospel music. You know, I remember he took me to a church in, in, in Hartford where he was living at the time with, uh, and because he was friends with this whole gospel choir and the reverend and everybody. And, uh, and, and he had such an open mind which is also, of course, represented in the openness of his music. You never know what's going what's to develop there. And uh, so it, there were other people. I mentioned Jackie Byard before. He was another one who was interested, began to be interested in non-European, non-jazz musics. They all did. I remember the first time there was a group, it must be at least 25 years ago, 30 years ago, there were a group of three or four Turkish musicians who by mere chance had studied at the conservatory in Ankara, where they had studied classical music, and somehow they had also gotten involved with jazz. I don't remember now how. Uh, and they put together a jazz rock group of a very high creative quality that combined Turkish old music, Ottoman music, might call it because Turkey was the Ottoman Empire, with jazz and classical music. I can't tell you, that's what I'm talking about, you know? And I, 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 I wouldn't have thought of that myself particularly, but that's the type of thing that began to happen in the 70s. I, I should add that uh, uh, there's some caution to be taken or there's some danger in mixing different musical traditions because it can be kind of just a pastiche of things, you know, and if, if it's done in a very superficial way. What I'm talking about is that when you do these um, cross-fertilizations, these amalgamations, you have to do it at the very highest creative levels and with complete authentic authenticity of the three things that you're melding together. Otherwise... No cheating. It, yeah, yeah. It, and, and, and the word commercial or thinking about making money with this or anything it must not enter. This must, pure, must be pure uh, artistic integrity. And there have been terrible things done under this, you know, where some record producer says, oh, well, let's see, let's combine Armenian music with you know, Norwegian music and uh, you know, some kind of crazy idea. And they get somebody and it, it's just awful what comes out. But at this authentic high, high level, it, it can be very beautiful because if you combine three ancient beautiful musics, Japanese gakaku music or whatever it might be, if you combine it, it's got to be good if the person doing it is making it. And, and the caliber of the faculty and the, the best of a conservatory model can, can make yeah. sure that yeah. it yeah. stays there. Yeah. yeah, and that's, I think that's what we, we have here. How many people are in, in this faculty now, in this department? Uh, I mean, are there, is this sort of permanent and then some extra people yes. that come in? Yes, that's right. There, yeah. there are, uh, Probably a core group of maybe eight mm -hmm. permanent, eight yeah. or ten, yeah. and then uh, a bunch of faculty that, yeah. that are sort of uh, you know adjunct, yeah, faculty, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then some then some visiting sort of artists of very high caliber yeah. Yeah. Come yeah. in for uh, you know every quick, semester quick for, <laughs> yeah. for a little while. Yeah. Gunther, I'm sure you ha you never have a quiet moment, but when you do have a quiet moment, do you? Do you think NEC's done a good job in, in uh, curating your, your gift here? Who, uh, who, is, who are you talking about, me? Yeah. What do, you, what do, you, do you think that NEC has, has kept your sort of legacy? <laughs> How well, you uh, well this is a question. no. Uh, look, I just intimated earlier that after I left, a lot of things that I started here were dropped. I had created five different vernacular orchestras, call them, including like three different jazz orchestras. We had an Ellington orchestra. We had a Paul Whiteman orchestra. We had an all-around big band 
uh, and I create a country fiddle band that from like from Arkansas or Missouri. I did, and I created an early music department. A lot of these things were dropped. I hate to say it, but it's the truth. As I say, they, these people just were not, I can't blame them and, and maybe, uh, maybe it's good that they didn't try to dabble with it when they really didn't know anything about it, you know, something. But that then, so this, there was this sort of lower curve, but then something developed again, I think a lot through Hankus, because when he started this Klezmer Orchestra and, and sort of other related music of that period, I think it, it, it was so successful that it opened up in many minds, I think, the idea, gee, we can put things like that out or together uh, or be interested in that. It takes somebody to do it, and then it somehow, sometimes, thank God, catches on. Yeah. I think maybe you're so far ahead of the curve yeah. that, you know, like the yeah. idea of having a country, a country fiddle band <laughs> yeah. in a conservatory yeah. seems strange. But now there's another one again. There's we, a huge faculty, of, uh, or not faculty, there's a huge student body yeah. of fiddle players now. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, we, we, I put together, I don't know, 12, 15 violinists. I had to teach them how to play as primitively as, uh, because, you know, they didn't know about, those folks in Missouri, they don't know about vibrato. They barely know that, uh, you know, you can use up bow and down bow. <laughs> or, um, and, and so I had to teach them how to play like they might have played the very first lesson, like, <laughs> but, uh, and they, they, of course, took it on and, and it was very exciting, but we dressed in overalls and we st stood in a line and then I added a washboard to the music and an accordion uh, of this great uh, genius musician, um, uh, Romano, Myron Romano, he, he, he played the accordion, uh, he played many instruments, so, and, and of course guitars and things like that. And uh, I, was, um, I was also interested in starting a um, Bob Wills, what, what was his music called? Texas Swing. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I was going to start that, but that was around the time that I left the school. So you started the ragtime ensemble. Oh, God, I forgot to mention <laughs> that, of all things. Yeah, because it's not just that, but that brought the, about the revival of ragtime. I'm not the only one, but there are three people who brought ragtime back after it had been dead for 40 years. And all the ragtimers like U.B. Blake that were still alive were not working. And that, uh, the other two are Joshua Rifkin, who made a recording of Joplin's, the first recording of Joplin's rags. Um, and it was beautiful, except he treated it like Chopin. And uh, he didn't recognize or didn't want to recognize that it was basically a black dance music. So it had this kind of swing, it had to be danceable. And he made all kinds of nice, beautiful, uh, incredible playing, but rubatos, and which ragtime, you know. And the other one uh, was, oh my goodness, a, a great American woman uh, historian who published, who spent her 10 years of her life getting all of Joplin's music published, uh, all of his ragtime pieces, and his opera, Tremonitia. And uh, it took, she was turned down by 16 publishers. And finally, the library uh, in New York, the music library in New York City, took it on. And so those three people, by publishing, almost all of Joplin's 40, 50 rags, you now could buy that and play the music. So between the three things, my ragtime group that ended up, uh, and my, that music ended up in the motion picture film, The Sting, uh, which made it a worldwide hit. Uh, so yeah, that too, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, what would you, um would you tell a, a prospective student thinking about coming to NEC? What, 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 would you, what would you want that person to think or know about contemporary improvisation here today? I, I have the feeling, I have the sense, and I, I get this from 
from other people who are more aware of all that the conservatory is doing, who are not necessarily in it, who are telling me this is one of the most exciting schools now. Uh, and I have that feeling myself, and particularly with these outreach things that the conservatory has done. There's a lot of schools that ain't doing anything like this. I mean, some, some of them have the excuse, well, we just can't afford to do that. We can't expand that that much. We're, we're too small, or we don't have the money, or we don't have the faculty. There, are, there can be all kinds of good excuses or reasons why not uh, get into these other regions. But the conservatory is doing it, and, and as I say, um, it certainly did it during my time. And, uh, and I, I think this, is, this has given the New England Conservatory a, re, a extraordinary high reputation. I mean, mind you, Juilliard and Curtis might be more famous schools, but they ain't doing anything like this, you know? And, uh, uh, you know, I, when, when a music school is mentioned on the news, the evening news, or in some other radio or television thing, or with, when Itzhak Perlman shows up somewhere, the only th word you ever hear is Juilliard. Once in a blue moon, they mention Eastman School of Music or, or New England Conservatory. Uh, and I find that sad, but you know, that's the way it is with our uh, pu publicity, journalism, and so on. But uh, no, I have the feeling this is now, again, a major school. By the way, in the 19-teens, the New England Conservatory, uh, during the time of World War I, all of that time, before World War I and right after that, New England Conservatory was the major school in the United States. And the only possible competi com uh, competition with it was Oberlin. And, yeah. Those were the two major, and those were the only two schools that, at that time, admitted black students. Uh, and then, then after a while, they both stopped it. That's a whole other story. But what I'm getting at, the, the New England Conservatory was that that's before Eastman School of Music, before Juilliard, before Curtis. And being also in, in the either the first or second greatest cultural, all-around cultural music center in the United States, namely Boston. This couldn't happen in, in I don't know, Dayton, Ohio or someplace. And, and it chose not to happen in Philadelphia. And they, and Mrs. Curtis, she created a beautiful music, uh, classical music school. But the New England Conservatory was, was remarkable. And then it fell on harder times uh, afterwards, and that's when I came along. So, brought it right back. so. Duncan, thank all right. you so much.